If the last few years have taught us anything, it's that stress and anxiety can cause a lot of harm, both mentally and physically. Stress contributes to poor sleep, fatigue, and mental fogginess. So how do we prevent or reverse this? Well, Organifi Harmony was created to support women specifically. Harmony combines 12 superfood ingredients into a delicious cacao and chocolate flavored superfood blend that not only helps PMS symptoms like bloating, fatigue, and mood swings, but also promotes better balanced hormones every day for improved women's health. You compare Harmony with Organifi Green Juice in the morning, which helps aid in healthier responses to stress. And this creates the perfect one-two punch against PMS. Organifi is a line of organic superfood blends that offer plant-based nutrition with high-quality ingredients and less than three grams of sugar. This Christmas, try Organifi Harmony to help you move from a depleted to nourished state and get back to the state of harmony you desire. You can experience Organifi's high-quality superfoods for less than $3 a day. Go to www.organifi.com slash best of you and use code best of you for 20% off your order. That's O R G A N I F I dot com slash best of you and use code best of you for 20% off any item. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Allison, and I'm so glad you're here to discover what brings out the best of you. This podcast is all about breaking free from painful patterns, mending the past, and discovering our true selves in God. I can't wait to get started as we learn together how to become the best version of who we are with God's help. Hey everyone, and welcome back to this episode of the Best of You podcast. I know this is one so many of you have been waiting for where we talk about this idea of people pleasing. And I don't really like that word because it's a little bit negative because I think for a lot of us, pleasing others comes out of a a very empathetic place, a genuinely kind place. And it's really hard for so many of us to discern the difference between pleasing others out of a sort of self-betrayal or even out of a way that isn't healthy for them or for the relationship and a way of just genuinely being aware of needs around us and wanting to meet them. So that's what I'm hoping to flesh out today with my dear friend and colleague and just an amazing woman who is a therapist, a professor. She hosts a podcast called And the Church Said. She's a coach consultant, and she's the co-author of a new book that we'll talk about a little bit later called Finding Hope in Dark Places. Dr. Monique Gadsen, thank you so much for joining me today for this conversation, Monique. I'm so grateful to have this conversation with you specifically. Thank you, Allison, for inviting me to be here with you. This is such an honor, such a privilege. I'm just so grateful. Grateful for you. Grateful for who you are. So thank you. We met on social media and you're one of those people, you know, right now I'm on a hiatus from social media and I'm kind of noticing the ways in which not having that noise in my life is healthy. But there are some things I miss. And you are one of those people. There are a few people I've met. I wouldn't have met otherwise if it hadn't been for social media. So it reminds me of the good. So thank you for being one of those people. I came across your feed on social media. You're so genuine. I found you on your live just praying one night when I really needed to connect in that way. And I joined you virtually for that prayer and just being a reminder of the goodness. And then we've connected offline and just so grateful for you and and your voice. Thank you. And likewise, likewise, I appreciate you being the the safe person that you are. I so often, well, you know, I listen to your podcast. So when I listen to your guests and those who have met you, who talk about your genuineness and your warmth and your just inviting spirit, I appreciate you. I appreciate you for being that type of person that restores my faith in people. So I appreciate that for you. Thank you. That means a lot to me. I wanted to start today, Monique, with an early history. When do you first remember learning that you could sort of shift your own behavior to please someone else? And 
how did that begin to take shape in your life? Yeah, so <laughs> one of my earliest remembrances is probably growing up a PK, a pastor's kid, for those who may not be familiar <laughs> there, a group of pastor's kids. So I was born in March. My dad was installed in his first pastorate in April. So all my life, practically, I mean, I, that's all I've known is being a PK. And even when he left to be with the Lord four years ago, he was still pastoring. So that's just kind of been, you know, the duration of his life. That's what I've known. And I think how that started is you would hear these messages, you know, about PKs and it's, you, well, you know how PKs are. And I would think like, well, how, how are PKs? And then I would hear that stigma, you know, they're wild, rebellious and all of the things. And I'm thinking like, well, I mean, we get in trouble. Yeah. You know, we get punished. Yeah. We got the spankings. Yeah. But I'm like, we're not just, you know, this picture that was painted. And I think there was something like within that made me want to say, no, that's not who PKs are. And in addition to that, I do believe the messaging like of my parents, you know, yeah, you are, you know, the pastor's kid, people are going to look at you, you know, this, that, and the other. And you're kind of like, well, okay, okay, okay. And so I think just early on, there was this sense of there is a way you have to be, there is a way you have to perform to please other people to, you know, not live out this perception that people might have of you. So I, I really believe that's probably where it started. You know, I love your book and your podcast. I love all things that you do, all, all the work that you put forth. But when you talk about kind of that cocktail, you I think you called it once with the childhood wounds, you know, the cultural um, condition and even those church messages. And I was thinking like, my goodness, bam, I sit right there in the midst of all of those things. You know, all of those are true factors that I say to my clients sometimes, you know, you put all of the ingredients in the in the slow cooker, right? And uh, with the right temperature and over time, this is what it creates. And so I believe that that's probably a bit of where it, it started when I have to really sit and think about it. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah that cocktail of codependency that, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I appreciate that, that there was, especially as a PK, there was this extra layer of don't bring shame on the family, I can imagine. You told me a story, Monique, about watching, was it your brother get in trouble or what? Can you tell me that story? That was such an enlightening and kind of window into that unspoken pressure in a way. Right. Yeah. There was a time when my oldest brother, well, my father had called for him to come to do something for him. <laughs> and so his mind was there, like, let me go see what dad wants. And there was an, an older lady who basically just kind of raked him over the coals saying, you know, he walked past her and he did not speak to her. And he was trying to be apologetic. He said, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't mean, you know, any harm. And, you know, just hello, how are you? And tried to keep it moving. But she just would not like let it go. And so then some kind of way, my I, I think my mom either saw what was going on or she went to my mom and I mean, she raked my mom over the coals, you know, and it was kind of this, well, if anybody's children should be, you know, uh, mannerable and speaking to people, it should be the pastor's children. And so, yeah, and that just wasn't a pretty encounter, you know, whatsoever. And I can remember thinking because you thought he didn't speak to you, you know, like, I could get it if he did say something and say something disrespectful or, you know, but the fact that he and he honestly, it was like an, it, it was an honest overlook. It wasn't intentional. So, yeah, that's that's what you're remembering. I'll I share with you. It, it just when I'm sitting here thinking about it, even right now and just feel like I'm right there in that moment in time, yeah. um, just even bringing it back up. But, yeah, so those types of things, you you just feel like you're hyper vigilant. Now you're walking around like, you know, you're in a pageant like, hello, hi, hello, hi. You know, <laughs> you're trying to speak to everybody, waving at everyone just to make sure that you are doing what is expected of you and you're not the cause because that's what you're thinking as a kid of someone that then is like, you know, taking your mom and taking her out to pasture, you know, it's like, okay. How old do you think you were when you watched all this? Oh my gosh. I like elementary school? Was, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Eight, nine-ish. Mm -hmm. And you think about there's a reason we remember these memories are etched 
in our for a reason. There's a reason that something in you was like, oh my goodness, I never want to make my mom feel that way. I never want to be in trouble like my brother is. <laughs> I love, I love. And then you're you're just kind of almost compulsively, I would imagine, you know, making sure you're saying hi to every person to avoid the pain of that moment. And I think this is what kind of in this series where, why I want to go back to these early memories because that is where we pick up this conditioning in so many ways that then we carry with us. We leave the house. We get out in the world. We're in college and we're still operating in these ways that we've learned. So how did you begin to notice that when you left the home as a young woman? Yeah, I don't know that I ever had like words for it. But I can just remember in college, in those early years of college, well, even adolescence, is this, who am I? Like that you're literally haunted kind of by that question. Now, I do notice some of that is developmental. (laughs) You know, if we kind of think about human development or Erickson's stages, some of that is just, it's to be. But I do believe that it was exasperated for me because there was this sense of trying to attuned to what is within, but that being smothered or just like crowded out by all of the other voices, you know, of who you're supposed to be and what it is that you are supposed to do. So I truly believe that it was from that compass where I kind of followed the path. So then you get in college, you know, and you're thinking, oh, okay, well, this seems like the thing I'm supposed to do, <laughs> you know, yeah. and not really checking in to say like, okay, is, but is this true to who you are? Does it yeah. feel like this is what you are supposed to do? What resonates with your soul? I had like no, no inner needle, if you will, yeah. to try, or I should say I had the inner needle, but I think it would be drawn more to those voices and all of that conditioning that had, you know, in essence, I guess, taught me how to suppress mm-hmm. me and yeah. what I desired. Yeah. And so how did that play out for you? How did you begin to notice that all of this effort, it's almost like I hear you saying you were so attuned to everyone around you. Mm-hmm. And I kind of get that picture. You use the the metaphor, the pageant queen. I love that. You know, you're so attuned to kind of making everybody else around you happy, pleased, that you didn't know how to attune inwardly. You didn't know how to attune to yourself. And how did you begin to become aware that that was a problem? I think depression. I think when I first started suffering from depression, I just remember feeling so heavy, (laughs) like I had this burden like on my back or just feeling that there was this persistent sadness that I couldn't explain. It just would not go anywhere. And I just I really struggled with like, what's wrong with me? Like, what is wrong with me? And at that time, when I was in college, I went to the counseling center on campus and had spoken with a therapist there, which was even looking back, it just, it was a divinely ordered step for me to take because, you know, in the African-American community, we just, therapy just was not a thing. And add that layer of being a Christian in the African-American community and in the church, that definitely wasn't a thing that was kind of talked about or promoted or affirmed even for that matter. So I just have to look back and believe that that was a divinely inspired step to take. But once I started talking about it, I think that at least it gave me uh, an outlet to be able to say some things. And I said these things clumsily because again, I didn't have I didn't have the words. And, you know, as a therapist, people are going to bring us like fragments, you know, and we're just kind of putting them down and trying to, you know, piece things together. And I know that's how I brought things. It was just fragmented. It's just trying to figure out like what's wrong with me, what's going on. Why can't I, you know, why don't I feel like living and why do I feel, you know, not happy and all of the things. So I think that that's how it initially had -hmm. begun to manifest was through depression. And also there was a lot of anxiety. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Monique, so bravely. I I just can kind of sense in my spirit others listening who feel that weight that you're describing and don't know how to put words to it. They just know they feel depressed. 
They don't know how to turn inwardly. They don't even know what they need. And I just appreciate the courage in what you just shared. And especially I can imagine, I think you and I are probably roughly the same age, but when you add that overlay of everything you described, being a PK, being in, you know, culturally, and then even the the time, that time period. I know when I was in college, it still was on the early end. I'm, a, you know, for you and I, it's not like everybody was going to a therapist. It wasn't as common even as it is now. And even now there's still stigma to it. So I just appreciate what you're saying, kind of almost like I can imagine there was a certain amount of desperation to go because it so wasn't a part of what you were taught was how to reach out for help. Yes. It was literally like fear because once I started thinking, why am I even living? Like, Mm. is there even any point to life? When I started feeling that, I went, wait, something something has to happen. Like I need to do something. And that, that was like all at that moment I thought to do. So, yeah. That is so brave. I can, I just put myself in your shoes and thank you for sharing that again. Cause I know it's real. I know mm-hmm. people feel that way and mm-hmm. there's a desperation and somehow you picked up a phone or walked into an office and it helped. And that, that's what I'm curious about. I imagine it, there was still a lot of work left to be done, but in that moment of giving voice, even kind of cobbled together words to another human, that that was helpful to you at that time. Is that right? Absolutely. It was. And I I don't even believe that there was resolve. Mm. (laughs) You know, I I didn't stay in it that long. And it wasn't because I did not desire the person that I worked with was, you know, college campuses, therapist in training, you know, so. Yeah, I've been one of those. (laughs) It's always, it's, it's scary, right? I'm sure you have too. It's like, how how am I going to help this person? (laughs) But I think that what happened, that person eventually, you know, had finished their term or whatever. And so I just kind of was like, okay, well, I don't want to have to retail this to someone else. And I, Mm -hmm. and, and again, for the purpose at that moment, there was relief. And that was, I think, was the biggest thing that there was a sense of relief and release for that mm. matter, you know, during that. And I think it, it, that probably was the beginning of my journey toward considering therapy, embracing therapy, and probably now that I mention it, probably one of the earlier footprints to even becoming a therapist myself. Mm. And I've never really even considered that moment in time. Um, I, I always kind of fast forward the timeline of my life and say, I think it was at this point. But now that I'm sitting here saying this aloud, I do believe that that probably was a footprint even there at that point of my developmental timeline too. Do you think maybe just that seed planted of what this person just did for me was so meaningful that that a seed was planted maybe for yourself? That's interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I love what you're saying, and I just kind of want to pause on it. Again, for those who are listening, who are feeling this weight even right now, and you know, we're going into Christmas, and sometimes I, I say to people, almost the pressure of the joy can yes. make the weight feel heavier. And so yes. what I love about what you're saying is, it probably wasn't, you know, this was a, probably a counselor in training, someone young. It's not like, you know, it's a college counseling center. It probably wasn't in hindsight, you know, it didn't solve all of the things, but there was relief. There was something, there was a glimpse. Mm-hmm. And that's sometimes all we need. You just took a step and you connected with another human and there was relief and it set a lot of things in motion. So I really, I really just appreciate your honesty about how how dark it was. It makes me understand a little more. We're going to come to this book that you just helped co-author, just the empathy that you have for others mm-hmm. who are in that dark place. Absolutely. And who are not only in that dark place, but who are in church mm. and who are in that dark place and feel as though... You know, this is, again, not what I'm supposed to do. It's interesting that you even talk about this joy of the season. And I I just, I remember thinking something. I can't remember if it were a podcast uh, here recently on that word joy. And just even once I did a word study on it, one of the ways it was defined is just sheer delight. Mm. And I thought to myself, like, wow, that feels a little less heavy <laughs> than the exuberance, you know, that we so often associate with joy, and, and which is a portion of it. But this sheer delight, and I and I thought to myself, like, wow, that feels a little less 
heavy. That feels mm-hmm. a little doable. And so even um, one day last week, I spoke with a client and, you know, going through a very, very tough time and right around, we were recounting the holiday, the Thanksgiving holiday. And, you know, for her, even just to struggle. And I said, you know, all you need to do is like, look at the smiles on your children's faces. And I asked her some other things and she said, well, you know, I do have a roof over my head. Yeah. Stay there. You know, Mm -hmm. just stay right there. Don't feel like you're saying this pressure to have to say, oh, and for all of these deep things I'm grateful for when I'm in the midst of this very difficult time, just find the sheer delight, the little things. And I'm hopeful that that does help people not feel so burden again, like, and this is the thing we have to do, you know, during this time, we have to um, conjure up this energy to be all of these things when, you know, that might not match what's really going on in the inside. That's a really good word. It takes the pressure off of this idea of joy as sort of the absence of suffering when really it might just be a shared delight in something really small. I've heard the saying, Shared sorrow is half the sorrow. Shared joy mm. is twice the joy. And there's something about the being with, even in a in a small thing, even that moment with you, with your client, mm-hmm. like, you know, mm-hmm. I, I do have a roof over my head. Mm-hmm. And sharing that with you, there's holiness mm-hmm. in that moment. Mm-hmm. That right there, that is a moment of, I mean, it brings kind of tears to my eyes because it is the holiness of our work is that, I am with you as you dig deep and find genuine gratitude, genuine, whatever the word is, joy does, it does. It feels so in, I I do have a roof over my head and Mm -hmm. you're helping me see that, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, I'm not kind of trying to conjure this up all by myself. That's beautiful. Yeah. Monique, how did your becoming a mom impact your own journey toward healing, toward connecting more deeply to yourself. You know, there's such a paradox, I think, when we become parents, it becomes very sacrificial. Mm -hmm. But in fact, I think we show up for our kids better when we've learned to show up a little bit more for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so how did becoming a mom impact your own journey toward becoming more of who you really are, becoming more authentic while you're also caring for your children? Yeah. You talk about those, you know, those twenties, and so I had become a mom. So I, I'm just coming out of college. A few years after college, I'm married, and you know, shortly a year after that, I'm a mom. And it's like, okay. <laughs> so there were some things I had already resolved that I wanted to kind of do a little differently, you know, um, as a parent. Some of the things we had talked about, some of our values and beliefs, and so. That was not necessarily, those things were not necessarily so hard to kind of implement, you know, as as becoming a parent. So, you know, again, here we are, you know, all of these messages, the conditioning and the church messages and and childhood even, because our stuff definitely is going to show his head (laughs) when we become a parent, you know, for certain. So there was a struggle. Oh, my God. There was a struggle even becoming a mom in doing what I feel like I'm being led to do, you know, as I'm studying this young person, I was a stay-at-home mom. So at at the time, just because the way life was, I wasn't working at the time anyway. And so we were just kind of like, it's going to really cost more for you to work and daycare at that time. And we were like, just, let's just kind of see her through the first few years. Okay, let's do this. So, I mean, even that, even that was a thing where, this is what we felt. But then there were others like, well, what did you go to college for? And I'm kind of going like, oh my God, like there's an expiration date, you know, on the college degree, <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, okay. I mean, so I, that was a message that would be, you know, kind of in my ear. And then, you know, another message like, yeah, you know, you're doing that and you need to do this too. And and it's just kind of like, you know, by the time these things collide in your, in your mind, you're just kind of like, oh my God, like, yeah. you know, then you're back to what do I do? Like, what do I do? And so, yeah, that is a struggle trying to kind of get through there and tease through what is everybody else's voice? What is everybody else's expectation mm-hmm. and trying to unbury <laughs> me and figuring out like, okay, 
how has God fashioned me to be a mom of this child? Like he gave me this child to carry, you know, you're going to know some things about this child before anybody else will know about this yeah. child. So trying to get to that place definitely was a struggle. <laughs> it definitely was a big time struggle. And also it made me realize I needed to heal or at least start some serious work toward healing in order to try to raise her mm. to be the young woman that God had created her to be. Mm. I could see early on how if I did not get myself together, how I would be a hindrance, you know, to her and for her. And, you know, by by no means <laughs> have I done that perfectly. You know, that was, a, that, and it still is, you know, a messy journey. Um, I think anybody that parents knows that, and my, both of my girls are, you know, young adults now. So even, even in this phase of life, you know, it still is a thing that requires yep. of me to be aware, to continually do my work as I, you know, try to guide and come alongside them as young adults. I don't want to give the impression that we spend a certain amount of time, we check a few boxes, we read a couple of books, we journal a few pages and we're done. Like we're over kind of this, you know, people pleasing kind of thing, right? There are places that we continue to struggle. I continue to struggle, you know, with that in life. Interestingly enough, even in my therapy, my current day therapy, you know, just kind of recounting some things in terms of trying to be a good mom even now. And my therapist shared with me some places where those were some experiences where you tried to please your girls more than parent them. And I was thinking like, are you serious? You know, so it was even interesting how that theme still even pops yeah. up, even in parenthood. What I love about what you're saying, first of all, for those who are listening, is there's good enough. Mm -hmm. So you're still learning things now. So am I. I'm shocked. You know, young adult parenting, young adulthood is a whole next Ooh. level thing, you yes, know, and you become whole new layers of our own stuff come to yes. the surface. Yes. And yet there's good enough. And so here you are back, you know, when she's a baby or new mom realizing I've got to do some more work on myself. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example where you realized that? How did you have the self-awareness to know at that moment, this is my stuff? that I've got to work through? Mm -hmm. Well, I think for me, one of the first things I had become aware of was just generational stuff, mm. <laughs> you know, too. I can remember, you know, some conversations with my grandmother and I would just kind of say like, well, you know, I don't think that's going to work. Or, you know, but again, the piece of me that did not want to be, again, here we go, perceived as disrespectful okay. or, you know, like I know more than you know kind of a thing. So it would be those kind of encounters where, you know, you're, you're kind of thinking like, okay, I, I hear what you're saying. I just don't know that that necessarily is going to work, you know, with me in this situation. So I was able to identify some generational things, which that was some insight that the Lord had just given me looking back, didn't know that then, had given me generational insight like early on in my life too. Again, I wouldn't have been able to put language yeah. to it. But when I look back, the, like you say, those things that I can remember, I remember for a reason. And yes. those were indicators yeah. of some generational stuff that I was thinking, oh man, you know, we might need to turn some corners with some things. So that was one way. And I think the other, for me, not only that fawn response, that people mm -hmm. pleasing, one of my, um, well, I would say my my go-to, if you will, kind of trauma response is is the freeze, the numb, you know, and, and I get stuck in indecisiveness okay, and just really could not make up my mind mm. what I wanted to do. Like, I feel like this is what I'm supposed to do. But all of those, again, other messages and, you know, the, the, the sweet mothers and grandmothers at church, you know, and you need to, and you make sure, and you know, you're like, oh, okay. and I want people to understand that these, I'm not saying that these things are not good. And these things were not words of wisdom. What I am saying is that when you're already struggling with trying to do what everyone else expects you to do, yep. it just becomes another 
another like layer that you have to try to navigate and and again kind of work your way through to say which of these things you know are good but maybe not necessarily what I am going to implement and what things do affirm what I myself you know want and wanted so it was it was hard trying to kind of <laughs> I remember that um I don't know if it's a movie or a show, and I'm probably really dating myself, but that journey to the center of the earth or something show, like way, way back when or whatever it was called, I kind of almost have that picture in my mind. It's like this journey to our core. Yeah. You know, it's almost like you're going to all these galaxies, you know, you're having to, yeah. you know, go through, through this layer and that layer and that layer. And it, and it feels like that, like trying to get to the core of who you are. It felt as though I, I just had to journey, 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 journey to even find out what resonates. Yeah, you know, with me. I love that the journey to the center. And I, mm-hmm. you know, I'm imagining you and I relate to it so much, Monique, that, that all the voices sort of amp up at these pivotal moments of which parenting is one. And it's well, often well intended. And that's what's hard. And then again, if you're an empathetic person, everyone's being well intended. And whether it's family members, it's generational stuff. These are people you respect. And that noise can get so loud. And if you already struggle to connect to your own inner compass, your God-given sort of barometer inside as you, you know, I really appreciate that you brought in that freeze response. There's sort of a deer in the headlights. Oh my gosh. You know, I don't know what to do in the immobility because I can't figure out how to manage all these voices around me. I can't even find the voice inside me. I'm no no longer even trying to please others. I'm just kind of inert. (laughs) And I've got this precious little baby that God has given me. You know, I love how you said that has given me and I have to be able to show up at the end of the day for this. I mean, that is intense. I love how you just kind of zoomed in on. I know every mom listening is going, "Uh uh-huh. Yep. I mean, it's just the voices get so loud around that time because so many women do struggle with knowing how do I need to show up for my child and myself? And it's going to look a little bit differently And so how do we help each other in a better way? Because we're trying to help, (laughs) but it isn't always helpful. Our help is not always helpful. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions, to learn productive coping skills, and to unpack some of that baggage, some of those painful patterns that keep you stuck in your relationships, in your work, in your life. Therapy is the closest thing to a guided tour of this complex, beautiful engine called you. This podcast is all about trying to help you gain a better understanding of your own heart, soul, and mind. And I don't think I've recorded an episode without talking about the benefits of therapy. In fact, as a trained therapist myself, I've needed the support of other therapists from time to time to help me when I'm stuck. If you're thinking about getting the support of a therapist and don't know where to start, Try BetterHelp. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. Let your therapist know that your faith is important to you to be sure they can respect that. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler There's no waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash best of you. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash best of you. The end of the year can bring a lot of stress and anxiety, whether it's shopping for your loved ones, preparing for travel, or just taking care of yourself. There's a lot to manage amidst the chaos. And that's why I'm so excited to tell you about the Abide, Sleep, and Pray meditation app. It's the number one Christian meditation app that helps you be your best and deepen your experience with the peace of Christ through biblical meditation. I have been so impressed with the different options available to you. There are meditations for emotions when you're feeling anxious, when you're feeling down. There are meditations for addiction, and there are also Bible reading plans I've especially appreciated the Bible reading plans. There's the Psalms of Peace, and then I just finished going through Matthew in a month. It's a beautiful way to connect to God and spend a few minutes caring for your own soul. 
With Abide's premium subscription services, you get early access to more content, ad-free meditation, and an experience you can cater to your needs. With background music customization, a sleep timer, and even a journal to help your habits and health become routine. Download the Abide app today and find peace amidst the chaos. Right now, I have a special offer when you subscribe. It's 25% off your first year when you sign up for the premium subscription. But only if you text my promo code BEST OF YOU to 22433. That's 22433. Don't wait. Download the Abide Sleep and Pray Meditation today and text my promo code BEST OF YOU to 22433 today to get 25% off. So again, you have another moment of like somehow by the grace of God, I understand here that the best way to be a mom is I've got to do more of this work to really zoom in on my own center. You find probably another layer of relief there. And at some point in this mix, you then also go back to become a therapist. So tell me a little bit about that. You know, you've got two girls, you're trying to find your own mom voice And not only going into being a therapist, but going into being a therapist in a church setting. So tell me a little bit about that. How did you know that you wanted to go into that, make that move? Oh, yeah. (laughs) You know, I, I think that this is when I think my spiritual life took a turn. I was at a funeral for, I did not know the young lady. I was there more in support for my brother. I was one of his dear friends who had passed. And died in a car accident and her middle name happened to be Monique. Mm. Now, and I didn't know that until I got there and I was just kind of like, wow, like, okay. (laughs) But it was there that I just had this, what I I termed this God experience, Um, young girl, very young girl. uh, She was in college when, when she, when she passed. So, and I just remember having this moment of like, what if this were your funeral? Mm. And what would people say or would you yourself feel that you have done what you were placed on this earth to do? Mm. And I literally left that funeral thinking, no, Mm. I have not. And I just earnestly sought the Lord in prayer and you know, just other spiritual disciplines like journaling, just these things that just were things that I've always kind of just done, (laughs) again, divinely ordered, looking back. But I had that conversation. I just begged the Lord to show me some things and my goodness, did he ever. (laughs) And a lot of what I saw and what he shared with me, and thank God at that time, there was a, a spiritual mother, a mentor, Mm. who after we had gotten married, we spent a little bit of time living in Mississippi. And so this lady I met there in that short amount of time that I was there, which is real interesting too, I would share these things with her and she would tell me just how she felt the Lord was leading me Mm. in that time. And what I recognized is, how dare I say, before one of the kind of first times, like really hearing him speak directly like to me, like Mm -hmm. to me, not necessarily through other people. Mm -hmm. And basically saying, I want you to counsel. I want you to go and train as a therapist and to do this, the church and that black church, like clear. (laughs) And I thought, okay, all right, this is cute and funny because, you know, I'm, I'm new to this. I, I definitely am not hearing correctly because Black churches don't do this type of thing. Like People don't do this thing. So I, I was, I, I struggled again and wrestled with, with trusting mm. that my voice and the voice of the Lord were intimate in that moment, that they were one and the same. So after confirmation that this is indeed the voice of the Lord, I am speaking to you. You are hearing me correctly. And I'm thinking, oh my God, okay. And so I started the journey then to prepare to be a counselor. Now, I believe looking back, one of the reasons why to do that in the church setting, for one, again, 
We're talking umpteen years ago. So I know things have, you know, progressed. Thank the Lord. <laughs> you know, um, people, as you were saying, are a little bit more accepting to counseling. Mm-hmm. You know, it's almost kind of become a little trendy thing to do. <laughs> so significant progress has been made. Yes. Still have a long way to go. Still yeah. have a very long way to go. Because I think that even in the church setting, again, we're getting better with allowing people to express their grief, their lamentations, you know, the heart of life. I think we're getting better, Mm. but I also still believe that we don't allow adequate time and space. I, I just don't believe that we do. And so that became my call. My life's work is to take these experiences that I had throughout my life and figure how can we correct these experiences, especially in the church setting, Mm -hmm. so that people can walk in liberty sooner, Mm. that they can understand that, again, I think in this day and time, we give a little space for a person to say, this is hard, but it's not long that that comes, you know, followed with this kind of spiritual cheer. (laughs) You know, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. You know, you can do all things through Christ. Truth, yes. But again, when we're in certain places in life, doesn't that feel heavy? (laughs) You know, like, doesn't that feel, maybe I know this, but what I need to hear someone say to me is, I understand you're depressed. And I'm wondering, is it because you've done everything that everyone else has wanted you to do and you are sad or you are feeling heavy because you have gone overlooked for so long? Mm -hmm. Do we open up that space and are we okay with stepping into that miry, murky kind of place with someone and not feel so compelled to have to spiritually kind of hurry them along Um, Because you and I very well know that spiritual bypass and A is a very real thing. Mm -hmm. And B, that that emotional work may take a little bit longer than sometimes we're willing to give that space and that time for. What a beautiful picture of taking all of that empathy that you both needed. You know, I'm thinking back to your college years when you had the heavy weight and the depression and found relief from a therapist and a PK, someone who grew up in the church and loves the church. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, God's voice and your voice, I love how you said that coming together. And it's like, okay, now you're going to go take that place of holding space Mm -hmm. for witnessing, for being with others' pain, for not fixing or bypassing or slapping Bible verses on, you know, just being with right into the church setting. Mm -hmm. That is just such a a beautiful picture. We talk about spiritual bypassing. It really is this way of kind of putting cliches, pat Mm -hmm. answers on things instead of really walking into the pain of others and just being with others Mm -hmm. in what they're experiencing. And just that picture of you in a church setting is really powerful to me. Do you think that whole issue is more elevated in a Black church? Yes. And I am speaking from my experience. Okay. Yeah. So growing up that life, still in that you know Black church life, and also having been a counselor in that setting, you know, I feel like it gives me a, a bit of an edge to be able yes. to say uh, yeah. yes to that. I do. And from what I have heard over time, wish I had the insight back then to have like collected some data, but I can remember what people would share with me. Kind of when you talk about these cliches, you know, we get, we get those things sometimes from the pulpit, which I've actually done a presentation on about how some of the messages from the pulpit, you know, hinder our mm-hmm. mental health and emotional mm-hmm. health, especially in the African-American church setting, how there is this historical reference. You know, we talk about how our people have endured and how our mm-hmm. people had to, you know, just kind of keep it moving, even under the most distressing of circumstances, extenuating of circumstances, they prevailed, they made it, and you you come from that. You're cut from that cloth. You should be able to do that too. They didn't have time to sit on somebody's couch to process their feelings. They had to, you know, keep it moving and you should be able to do that too. So I think that some of that is embedded in that historical context. Yeah. Um, you know, generationally and then we want to talk about cultural drama for 
certain generational trauma, it's just been transmitted, you know, oh, from okay. um, generation to generation. And, and I want to say to people, it is an act of resistance to feel. It's an act of resistance to feel because, you know, if you've had people, you know, if your ancestors, your enslaved loved ones were told, you know, shut up, boy, or, you know, you can't show any kind of emotions when your families are being ripped apart, all of these things, then do we not owe it to our ancestors to cry out, you know, to Uh. even carry some of that that was never expressed by them? We can bellow those things out. Wow. Oh, that's powerful. That just gave me chills. You know, I think about the night before my father's funeral, a lot of his first cousins had come to the funeral home when we had like the family visitation time or whatever. And I've known some of them just over the years, you know, it it was a lot of them, but it was just interesting to me that they shared with me that night that my grandmother, so my father's mom was the one that like their parents. So we're talking my grandmother's siblings would be, you know, their parents. So Mm -hmm. their, their fathers and their mothers, they chose to put their money together to send my grandmother to school. They felt she was the smartest one. And so they put their money together. They worked to put her through school. And I told them I had never, ever heard that before. But what I did know is that education was super duper important. You know, to my grandmother and to her children and thereby to her grandchildren. So I say that to say that if we if we say things like, you know, for us to obtain an education or to you know have the right to vote, we should do this because our ancestors could not or they fought for this. Then I would say the same thing about our emotional healing. Yeah. Okay. I get what you're saying. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And there's a whole nother layer. And I remember talking about this with you. You so kindly read the best of you and endorsed it. And I remember I wanted to know from you, because in that cocktail of codependency and the cultural Mm -hmm. conditioning and the messages we get from culture as women, you know, to stay small or, you know, and there's just generational, you know, we couldn't vote. You know, there were lots of things we couldn't do. My mom couldn't get a credit card, literally. And my mom's a brilliant woman, college educated couldn't get a credit card if my dad didn't co-sign it with her. You know, I mean, there's just like, that was not that long ago, you know, these kinds of things. But I remember when I was talking with you, Monique, and I was like, and I'm so aware that as a white woman, there's one thing. And then you add the layer of being a black woman Mm -hmm. in a country where there's so many more layers of Mm -hmm. the ways of the different cultural messages, both from the dominant culture and also from your own about how you're supposed to... Yes. resist. And so when you think about that, even when you talk about like people of color, <laughs> and I am sensitive to that there are, you know, many people of color that can possibly resonate. I tend to have to say, even when we talk about this kind of people pleasing, right, mm-hmm. this fawning, yeah. I have to step out from underneath that label. And I have to say I am a Black woman because I get lost even in the label of Uh, people of color. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah. I just think that Black women's, our experiences are so unique. Yes. So very unique. And I think that because of the uniqueness of those experiences, that expectation of you know, you, you're you going to put it on your back. You're going to carry the weight of, and that's kind of like a fill in the blank. Okay. So the women had to do that. You know, when, when their men were stripped away from them, and I'm also kind of thinking of, um, I don't know if you would have just recently have seen, you know, Black Panther. Oh yeah. Whatever. Wak- so, Wakanda. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm even thinking about some of the themes I felt in that movie yeah. You know, when um, the queen had to talk about her husband, you know, and, and, and just like kind of the absence of the black man. So there is this expectation that the black woman has to do these things. You know, we have to protect and we have to provide. We have to do. So yeah, that can be lost when sometimes we talk about this people of color label. So I have to kind of step out from underneath that and say, but as a black woman. 
Interesting. This is my experience. This is what I am having to tease through and discern and and body definitely is going to tell us a whole lot of stuff even before our mind kind of catches up with it, right? So yeah, we have some very unique experiences in terms of that that expectation, that expecting to to do what others need and want for us to do. If I'm hearing you right, it's kind of like, and what comes with that is an extra layer of pressure to do things in a certain way. And you're coming in and saying, what if part of the resistance, part of honoring the strength is to honor the lament, is to honor the weight and get healthy and heal. I just want to pause and just say, man, that what a beautiful, you know, again, to circle back to then you stepping into the church Mm -hmm. to bring all of that light into, you know, all of that healing right there. You know, it's just a beautiful picture to me. It's a picture to me. I I think we can all learn from Mm -hmm. why shouldn't we be bringing the healing into the church versus going to church and then going to therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just think that is a brilliant, beautiful way that you began to use your, your voice that was so hard earned. Mm -hmm. So hard earned. And if you think about just even, you know, the people pleasing, if you will, even of the bridegroom, (laughs) you know, it's Mm. the scriptures will teach us that we are nourished. You know, we Mm. are cherished. We are going to be presented without spot and without blemish. Mm. This is the work of Jesus, right? Mm. So are we pleasing people by trying to hide our blemishes? and our spots, and our wrinkles. Mm. Can we free even those of us who, yeah, love the church and are in the church to say, I'm blemished, spotted, I'm wrinkled. So I tend to think of that like on a systemic level, like how even systemically do we find ourselves in this this fawning, you know, this, this, yeah. this pleasing. Galatians 1.10 clearly states, you know, are we going to please God? Are we going to please man? And I think that's interesting. That's black, white. And I think that there are places where it's clear, you know, but there's a whole lot of nuance, as you very well know, that we have to, we have to deal with and we have to live within. And I think that we have to be careful that we are not communicating to people that to do this is pleasing to God when it can really just be your pleasing man. Uh, that's so nuanced. And it actually makes me think of this idea of is it there's a way in which we can almost in an unhealthy way use the fawn response or pleasing yes. with God. Yes, ma'am. You know, yes, because ma'am. we're we're trying to and I love what you're saying. It's when we're trying to cover over the blemishes yes. to please God, which is not what God wants. God wants the honest, real person that we are. And so can that kind of trickles into our relationship with God, to our relationships with the church versus really showing up. And it requires so much safety, Monique. And you and I've talked about this, but to be able to show up with our blemishes, you know, I feel like there's so much tenderness even in this conversation because Mm -hmm. we're going to fumble, but to show up like kind of, you know, I kind of picture like this, like, this is who I am, you know? Mm -hmm. And the problem is folks will hurt us yes. when we do that. And so right. it's tricky. We, we have to create this, this safety so that people feel like they can. Mm-hmm. And again, gets back to what I think it's, is so beautiful about what you did is bring the counseling right into the church setting to begin to model what that looks like for mm-hmm. folks. I want to just touch on your new book you co-authored with Clarence Schuler. It's called Finding Hope. It's, it's just so flows right out of what we're talking about, Finding Hope in a Dark Place, Mm -hmm. facing loneliness, depression, and anxiety with the power of grace. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really, you know, when I read it, stood out to me, and it's a lot of what we're talking about, was the friendship, Mm -hmm. the way that just the, it wasn't even therapy. It was just Mm -hmm. the way that you showed up for your friend who was struggling with depression. Mm -hmm. And so in the book, he's telling his story of struggling, Mm -hmm. and you come along as kind of his his expert, his friend who's an expert, to give language Mm -hmm. to some of the experience of depression, suicidal Mm -hmm. ideation, anxiety, you know, from a more clinical background. But really, you can tell it was your friendship that Mm -hmm. just brought so much hope to him. And and it was just such a beautiful picture of, it's like what you said, the little joys. Mm -hmm. Like, here's a friend who just sent me a text and said, are you doing okay? Mm -hmm. 
And that gave him some relief. You know, Mm -hmm. it was just a really beautiful picture. So I wanted to just hear a little bit more from you on your experience, again, of using this hard-earned voice, Mm -hmm. you know, that you have to go to the journey to the center of the earth to find it. And then here you are coming alongside so beautifully in this book. What was that like for you? It was hard. (laughs) <laughs> very, very, very hard, very yeah. hard to speak mm-hmm. into that because it, it goes back to, okay, is it enough? Is it is it too much? You know, this. How do I get this right? You know, I want to please him and his publisher because when he came to me with the idea, I'm like, what in the what? Like what? And he was like, yeah, you know, they just really felt like this would be really great, you know, to have the voice of a therapist. And he was like, I'm thinking, I know the one to get, you know, like, and I was like, oh my god, okay. So that was very, very difficult to find my voice. That you know, I give him some submissions, and he was like, is this all you got? And I'm like. Oh God. So I'm like, I'm not pleasing. But then he's like, no, Monique, like say the thing, like say it. And I'm going, okay. And so I, and I didn't want to be accused of like, you know, saying too much or like now it's just, it's more about me. You know, so it it was hard for me to figure out how to strike that balance. But Mm -hmm. thankfully, you know, he was just real gracious and just like money, just, just do your thing. That's what I need you to Mm -hmm. do. And I said, okay. So it was a, it was a beautiful experience. Once I finally found my my flu, if you will. I hope that people do understand, like you were saying, that it's not so much based on me being a therapist, but what the power of relationship yeah. can do. And, and you know, and I kind of, I like how we're kind of almost rounding out with that, where we kind of opened up when I even shared, you know, about just you and what people say about you being in relationship with you, relating with you. And it is a powerful thing. I know, you know, I have benefited from being in relationship with you. You have given me corrective emotional experiences on various levels. And I just won't even, you know, name those, but you have. So when we think about this context of just in relationship, thinking about this grace that is sufficient that the scripture tells us. But when we find it in those dark places, it is when we name, like I did with Clarence, like you have to be disappointed, you know, and he was yeah. he wanted to kind of skirt around it and, you know, kind of deny it. No, no, you know, I'm just mad, you know, and I'm like, oh, well, from, for black men, usually they're going to be mad before they're going to be depressed. <laughs> uh-huh, you know, uh-huh. so that, that can be like most people are going to, you know, misconstrue mm-hmm. that, like another but angry black man. No, oh, maybe it's another depressed yeah. black man. Yeah. So being able to name that and to be able to say, you know, there is grace in that place. If the scripture tells us where we are weak is where he is made strong. So it's right there at that point of intersection where grace is found. Yeah. Yeah. So I I just, I, I believe that It is imperative, again, kind of going back to church. We're many members, but we're one. If we are going to be able to rejoice when others rejoice, weep when they weep, shoulder life with people, shoulder to shoulder life with people, or even at times bear the infirmities of those, you know, who are Mm -hmm. weak those who are strong at that moment. And I kind of, that's my emphasis, like at that moment, because we're going to have our day, right? We're going to have our day. We have to be able to name ours in order for us to name it in others, even when they're trying not to. Yeah. And I think that that's where grace is found. I think that that's where grace is found. And so I I just believe that if we're going to be healthy individuals, if we're going to be a healthy society, if we're going to be a healthy church, Mm -hmm. we have got to name what we are feeling. We have to allow other people to do it. We have to allow them the space to do it and also provide adequate support and tools to help them to navigate their way through those dark times. Yeah. It's a beautiful book, but just that friendship, what you just said, and the way that you helped him name what was happening was really powerful. And I learned a lot about friendship. I thought about it. I'm like, oh, So much of it is just naming. I see you. I see what's happening. This makes sense. Your experience is valid. I'm with you in this. You know, we don't have to fix it. We're just coming alongside. And it's been an honor for me that you invited me in, Monique, Mm -hmm. because 
a little bit into our friendship, you know, to say, yeah, I get it. I see it. It's just, it's meant so much to me. And I've learned so much from you through that book about, oh, this is how we do it. Just for our friends, you know, I know I feel so much pressure. I got to like fix the problem. I got to give them the the solution. I've got to give them the nugget of wisdom that'll change their life. And it's like, really, all I have to do is be like, I see it. I get it. That's right. I, I hear you. That's valid. How you doing? You know, it's just, it's just really showing up. Mm -hmm. Um, And that, I think, to bring this kind of full circle, I think, you know, I started this off saying sometimes it's hard for me to know what's the difference between genuine kindness, genuine just showing up for others and pleasing. Yes. Right. And I think that sort of is getting at it. It's when I've done, and I love how you say this, it's when I've done enough work in my own self that it's like, oh, I know that. And I can come with you and name that, not because I'm trying to get something from you or feel like I'm the best friend here or or whatever. It's because I've done the work in myself and now I have the ability and the capacity to take that God-given empathy and that God-given kindness to say, oh yeah, this mm-hmm. is real and mm-hmm. I'm with you in this. And there's a withness mm-hmm. in that. It's powerful. And I'm beginning to understand that difference. Mm-hmm. But but you're your friendship with Clarence and the way that was modeled in the book was really instructive to me. Mm. Um, it was really powerful and really helped me. I think about mm-hmm. it a lot in like how mm-hmm. I show up for other people. Mm-hmm. It was subtle. It was nuanced, but it was very powerful. Yeah. Oh, thank so. you for saying that. That means a lot coming from you. It's just easy. And I know you know this And my, my final kind of comment. It's easy for us to get lost in other people if we don't know, like you say, who we are enough. We're not aware enough. We're not going to ever have a hundred percent. You know, that glorification yeah. is going to take place on the other side. Yeah. But at least do we know even what our limits are, what we lack, what we might be trying to get from other people. If we're not aware of that, then we so easily are going to fall into that, you yeah. know? So yeah, it totally. is important. So important for us to do that intrapersonal work so that we can then be able to love the Lord our God with everything that we have and then love our neighbor as thyself. And I think that's right there. That's the cornerstone. Mm -hmm. That's right. There's a term in IFS in internal family systems that I kind of like it, but they call you have to have a critical mass of self. Mm -hmm. And what they mean by that is just enough. (laughs) Nobody's ever going to be really there, but just Mm -hmm. enough of that Mm -hmm. Mm self-led. And we would say the Holy Spirit led self, Mm -hmm. right? The spirit led Mm-hmm. place mm-hmm. of versus the I'm trying to please, fawn, cope, survive, get you to like me, whatever the things are that go along with people pleasing. There's enough self of a spirit-led self. No, no, no. I'm showing up for this person out of the best of me. That's right. What would you say, Monique, to that young girl mm. now, right, who watched, you know, her brother and her mother and learned <laughs> how to just wave and smile and nod? What would you say to her now? Oh, my God. Oh, without crying. (laughs) Oh, that is going to be okay. Mm. It's going to be okay that, that literally all things do work together for good. Even the things that are not good, things can work together for good. I think that's what I would say. Just hold on, (laughs) hang on. Even when you don't want to hang on, all things will work together. They will work together for a good that's beautiful. Thank you. I want everyone who's struggling to hear that. That's that's a word. That's a hard-earned word. Mm-hmm. What would you say to those who are listening who struggle with pleasing others and have a hard time really feeling that joy of being God's beloved child? Yeah, that you're worth it. You are worth the hard work. You are worth telling others to hold on. You're worth saying no. You're worth saying, let me think about that and get back to you. So in other words, you are worth creating that space Mm. to do whatever work you need to do to be able to hear not only your own voice, not only your own beat to your heart, but also how God is speaking to that voice within and how he is also attempting to slow down Mm. that beat of our heart when it's anxious or to even speed it up when it's slowly beating because we're lethargic. Mm. 
you're worth creating that space. That's beautiful. What is bringing out the best of you right now? Oh, my goodness. The fact that God has graced me, favored me with relationships, again, such as you, (laughs) that have allowed me to show up as Monique, Mm -hmm. not who people think Monique should be or expect her to be, but who Monique is. That brings out the best in me. Have that safety to just be. I love that. that. That's it. Mm-hmm. I love that. And what needs or desires are you working to protect in your life right now? You have said it repeatedly, and I know people can't see us, but I'm over here shaking my head like profusely. That hard earned voice and that wisdom. So many times we can be made to doubt and to wonder. <laughs> And to, you know, maybe feel like, yeah, you are selfish or whatever else the case may be. But that that hard earned voice and the wisdom, that is what I'm working hard to protect. And I surely encourage all others to do the same. Yeah, we need your voice. It matters. And especially the hard earned voice mm-hmm. that has been through the fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's powerful. It's holy. <laughs> How can people connect with you, Monique, your work, your podcast, your resources, your services? Yeah, they can reach out to me via my website, it's Dr. Monique Smith, not to my father, <laughs> Gadson.com. That's G-A-D-S-O-N. I know many people spell my last name many different ways, but it's G-A-D-S-O-N. I'm like you. I have that kind of love-hate relationship with social media. Oh, my God. But I try to hang out on Instagram every now and again at Dr. Monique Smith Gadsden. And every now and again, I might send a tweet (laughs) and I may show up on Facebook as well. But those are, go to the website is the main way and Instagram probably would be the, the main way. The podcast is and the church said and that's a, another story, too, in terms of just voice and just following what the Lord is saying to do and how I've ha- even had to learn that maybe it's a tool of healing. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you. I so appreciate the time you gave us today, and I'm so grateful for you. Thank you so much for having me, Allison. I appreciate you. Thank you for joining me for this episode of The Best of You. Be sure to check out the show notes for any resources and links mentioned in the show. You can find those on my website at drallisoncook.com. That's Allison with one L, cook.com. Before you forget, I hope you'll follow the show now so that you don't miss an episode. And I'd love it if you'd go ahead and leave a review. It helps so much to get the word out. I look forward to seeing you back here next Thursday. And remember, as you become the best of who you are, You honor God, you heal others, and you stay true to your God-given self.